Good morning. Good morning. Wonderful day today. It's great to see you. Let's now just all stand up. Let's just open up in prayer and commit our service to the Lord this morning, okay? Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Heavenly Father, we're so grateful, we're so thank you for the gift of life and for today, Lord, as we come to you. We just ask you right now, Father God, and just for your overflowing of your blessing to us, Lord. And I just ask you right now, Lord, as we lift our voices, as we lift our heart to God, open our hearts, our mind to worship you and just come and minister. Minister to our hearts, minister to our minds, minister to every part of us, oh God, and bring healing, Lord, to every part of our lives today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Start with the song, You, You Are God. Let's just declare that, that truly He is God.
then who you say I am. Can you just pull that? Who you say I am. Thank you. Thank you, Lord, for the identity that you have marked to each and every one of us, Lord. And we can say, Lord, we are sons and your daughters.
the words of comfort that you have left to your disciples and you said, do not let your heart be troubled. Believe in God and believe also in me. And in my Father's house, there are many mansions. And he's there to prepare that mansion for us, that place for us. And thank you, Lord. And that words of encouragement, not just that he left to his disciples and also to us, the saints, your people. It's the hope of glory that we have, that you have prepared a place for us. And thank you, Lord, while we're here on earth, we will continue to trust you. We'll continue to hold on to the promises. And we will not be in bondage of fear because you are the light and also our salvation. We're the longest laid to fear. And let's just sing that song together. And let's just cast all our fears and all our anxiety this morning to him. He did say, cast your cares to me. Oh, he cares for us. Let's just sing it together. You unravel me with a melody. You surround me with a song.
Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus, that you have made provision. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. You will make a way when there is no way. Thank you, Jesus. You've split the water so we can walk through it, Lord. There's nothing impossible with you. And we continue, Lord, to trust you. We continue, Lord, to sing praises to you. And know that your promises are yes and amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. We praise you, Lord.
Father, thank you that you see everything that we are going through. You see all our joys, and you see all our troubles, and you see all of our need, anxiety, and sadness, whatever it is, oh God. You see them. And therefore, you have given us an invitation to say, just come. Come unto me, all you that are born heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And Father, we just ask you right now, that rest that you have promised, but we have to come. We have to come to you. And give it to you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for your promise. And you said, just come to me, all that labor, and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Thank you, that rest that comes from you. Rest to our souls, rest to our mind. And that is the peace that comes from God that surpasses all understanding. And so therefore we're so thankful today. Let us continue and be still and know that God, that he is God. And he is in control of everything. And he looks after us, amen? Amen, you may be seated. All right, well, um, let me see, who are we here? Anyone visitors here for the first time? Yeah, where are you from? From Portugal. Oh, Portugal, so, very good. Uh, does that mean you speak English? And a bit of, a bit of uh, Portuguese, and what else? A little bit of French. Ah, very good, very good. Yeah, cool, well, very good to see you. What's your name? Daniel. Daniel, good to see you, Daniel, welcome. And uh, we have our Spanish people over here, some Spanish, and Mexico, and uh, Bulgaria, and uh, various other places. So uh, it's good to see you. And some people are not here today uh, because of um, holidays, but uh, it's good to see those who are here. I mean, it's good to have Daniel and Stephen at the front doing the uh, sign or computer desk. Yeah. I was wondering what we're going to do. And I think the song selection actually turned out quite well um, for what we're doing. I want to also greet those who are joining us online. There are some people, obviously, they aren't able to make it sometimes, and sometimes it's because of distance, other times because of health. 
but um, we're good to have Muriel and Larry joining us there online, and Manu, wherever Manu is, I think he's either in Dublin, Spain, or Shannon. Sometimes he's, because of his work, he seems to fly around the place. <laughs> so I don't know where he is today. Um, so it's good to have you here, and good to hear the news that uh, David's coming back uh, home this weekend, this tomorrow, Tuesday, isn't it? Or is Sheila there? And, um, Oh, there's a one announcement, by the way, for the women next weekend. If you're interested, there's a women's conference in Cork, uh, Friday and Saturday, uh, run by the people at uh, Calvary Cork. And so you're asked if it's an announcement. If you want to know more, you can come and speak to me afterwards. Okay, um, I don't know if the children are going out, but let's, let us give on to the Lord if, if you have... Uh, brought an offering or a gift to give to the Lord's work this morning, please feel free to do so. And while we're doing that, let me just give you one or two other announcements. Um, don't forget, we meet here on a Wednesday night at 7.30. For those who are interested, it's a Bible study because we are going through one of the most difficult books of the Bible, the book of Revelation. And we learn an awful lot there, but there's uh, a lot of different views, of course. But um, it's good to for people to bring their ideas to the table, and everyone gets to have their say. Amen. Right, Jack? Yeah. Yes. And um, it's it's just great to see the fire, and the passion that people have for their own their their various viewpoints. Amen. But at the end of the day, we all go home friends as we have the one Savior and Lord. Amen. Let's just give thanks. Uh, Lord God, thank you for your blessing upon our lives and upon this church. We are small people, Lord God, but we have got big faith. and We trust in a big God. And we trust, Lord God, you've got great plans for us for the future, Lord God, as we begin to build and get strong in the things of God. We pray, Lord God, for your blessing in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, as you know, this is a special weekend because it was on the 8th of July, 1998, that we, and myself and Stephen and Hannah, came to live in Killarney because we had been asked to come here through different ones over the years, but eventually we were asked to come and would we plant a church in Killarney? So that was, we moved here on the 8th of July, 1998, and we just kind of found out what God wanted us to do. By about September of that year, we started to have meetings in the cultural center, I believe it was. And so that's been great to see the number of people. And even as you walk around the town and people we've met over the years, and even on the internet, there's so many people that have been touched uh, and have been ministered to over the years. So praise the Lord for that. And some of you are here today and thank you for your uh, your comments and greetings through Facebook sort of that and also someone's birthday so there you go um, <laughs> what's, what, what's, Happy birthday to my okay uh, well you know thank you for that but it just reminds me the only reason why it's important is because that's the same date that we came here and it's easy to remember so 25 years being living in Blarney, you know, and that's that's a long time, you know, and uh, we thank God that we're, we've been in all these different places of meetings, but that's where we are today in the school. So praise the Lord. Um, and we've been having great fun. Uh, we've uh, developed a YouTube channel, which has been quite popular, uh, at least it seems like it. Especially when people see the evangelistic outreach, things like that, they seem to like that part. So praise the Lord. So praise the Lord, and we are um, always changing and getting better at what we're doing, hopefully. And today we continue in our series. We're going to be in the book of Psalms. And let me just pray for that before we go. Father God, thank you for the word that will change our lives and that uh, you will open our hearts and minds to receive the word, transform us and change us by your word. 
because there's nothing else that really matters but your word, Lord God, because it's, as we've heard, the truth shall set you free. So we thank you for the word. We pray for the Holy Spirit's enlightenment and the understanding that you give us. And everything we do is for your honor and glory, so that Jesus will be glorified. Amen? No. We are going to be in Psalm 27 today. I don't know if you are familiar with Psalm 27. How many have ever read Psalm 27 or even learned a song based on Psalm 27? I remember an old song uh, that was based entirely on that uh, text. So let's look at the first three verses. And if you look at the heading, first of all, it says Psalm 27. Uh, it's a, well, in your Bible, it will say an exuberant declaration of faith, a Psalm of David. And I just call this a declaration of faith in God's salvation. And yes, it's a Psalm by David. And let's look at verses one to three. So it says, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked came against me to eat up my flesh, my enemies and foes, they stumbled and fell. Though an army may encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war may rise against me, in this I will be confident. From the very get-go, he's straight out of the gates. David is super confident, isn't he? Really confident of the Lord's salvation. And yet, um, have you ever wondered what it means when it talks about when David says the Lord is my light and my salvation and as far as I know this is the only place in the whole of the Old Testament where God is called light but we know like from our New Testament studies that he's not just it's just there's more to it than just that but think about it what does it mean the Lord is my light and my salvation have you ever been lost in the dark completely in a darkened, or maybe you were in an escape room and you had to escape from the darkened room. Ever been in one of those? And you have to find the light or some source of getting your directions. So if you were completely in the dark and said, I need to find, first of all, some lights, or some people follow the stars, don't they? Some are looking for the light of the moon. They're looking for something that will help give them some kind of orientation. But if the Lord is my light and my salvation, he's bringing me to not just lights that he has created, but also he is light himself because light is a synonym for him being the truth, right? Don't we know it from the New Testament, for example? What does the scripture say in, in John chapter 8, verse 12? It says, Jesus said, I am the light of the world what did he mean he's not the sun the moon or the stars he's talking about something else isn't he when he says i am the light i am the one who's given the truth and understanding insight revelation all of these things is what he's referring to when he says that he's the light of the world so when david can say in this psalm the lord is my light and my salvation he's not just talking about the one who created the light because Genesis chapter 1, verse 3, one of the very first words that we read of God speaking, of creation. He says, let there be light. And light was. And, but also in verses 14 to 16 of Genesis 1, it says he made the greater light and the lesser light. And he made the stars. He made all of that. And some people are looking to those things that he created instead of the one who created them. And that's the problem. So say, for example, um, even in religion, they talk about being enlightened, getting light and revelation. And that's a good way of describing coming to a better understanding of truth. But it's not always the truth just because people talk about light. I was uh, at a place yesterday and a man seemingly was evangelizing me. I thought I would like to maybe evangelize. He started to speak to me. And as I listen to the things that he was saying i saw no evidence of any scripture no evidence of anything to do with the bible and i just thought something's not right here and it was all talking about truth 
and yet there was no true light there. Because if you're not basing it on the text of Scripture, what are you basing it upon? Feelings, he said. Feelings. And that is a terrible thing because feelings, how many have ever got your feelings wrong and made a mistake? Oh, here's something else about light. If you turn over to 1 John, and while you're turning there, 1 John, the Bible says that God dwells in unapproachable light in 1 Timothy chapter 6, 16. He dwells in unapproachable light that no one has ever seen or can see. I mean, we're talking about an intense light there. Okay, what sort of light are we referring to uh, when it talks about God is light? 1 John in the New Testament, 1 John chapter 1, verse 5 says this. This is the message which we have heard from him and declare to you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. What's that mean? There are no gray areas with God. Someone says, well, I, I believe in God. He's my light. He's my source. And yet they're dabbling in things that have got nothing to do with light. There's some areas of darkness that they're involved in. Isn't that what it says? In him, there's no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. Okay? What does that mean? So I like do a little bit of that on the side. Apart from God, I have a few other things that I do, which uh, they may not be 100%, but you know, I do the, a bit of both. Well, in God, there's no lying. There's no darkness at all, okay? And if we say that we have fellowship with him and at the same time walk in darkness, we lie. We're lying to ourselves. We're lying to other people. In fact, we're really just deceiving ourselves. We lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. You know, all of that darkness is sin in our lives and needs to be got rid of. Amen? So when, when David says in Psalm 27, the Lord is my light and he is my salvation, he's all of these things to David. And he's not only saying that, but he's saying, if you read on down in chapter 27, uh, it says also this, uh, of whom shall I be afraid? When you're walking in the truth and in the light of the truth, why should you have any need for fear? Fear goes out the window, doesn't it? The more truth that fills your heart, the more that darkness starts to go, and you can say, I'm not afraid of things that I used to be afraid of because I have better insight now than I had before. When you don't have knowledge of certain things, you can be scared. Electric cable, ah, oh, it's an electric cable, I can't go near that. It's not even plugged in. Oh, okay, didn't know that. Well, if you had known that, you know, and other things, you, you were free because you were not informed enough. Okay, it can cause a lot of fear. The more truth that comes into your heart through the word of God, you're gonna be super confident. Like this, whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked came against me to eat up my flesh, Ever felt like that's happening? Not, I don't mean a zombie attack, but like it's, it feels like they're coming against me. I'm getting grinded on, bitten, uh, attacked in every way. When they came against me, my enemies and my foes, they stumbled and fell. So he's seeing something here of uh, them trying to come against him, but they're being knocked back. Though an army may encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. I mean, can you imagine being surrounded by an army? And you say, even then, I shall not fear. Though war may rise against me, in this I will be confident. This is a real confident prayer, isn't it? Now, some have saw, I don't know if you saw this or not, as we were reading that, but some have seen there a, a foreview or a foreshadowing of Jesus Christ. You remember the time when he was in the Garden of Gethsemane and he was surrounded by his enemies. And what happened? They said, they're looking for Jesus of Nazareth. And he says, who are you looking for? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. He says, I am he. And what happened? They stumbled backwards and fell to the ground. So some have seen this and said, that's what 
happened to Jesus. David foreshadows Christ, and you see, not just here, but later on in the same psalm, you see, there is some similarity, but there's probably many times when David says, I was, I was being attacked by my enemies. They were all around me, but they stumbled. They fell. They, their plans just fell apart at the last minute. So I am confident. Now, in your Bible, it might say this, the Lord's the strength of my life, okay? The strength of my life. And in other translations, such as the NIV or other, it doesn't just say the strength, but the stronghold. You know what that means? That you're in a stronghold, in a safe place. You're, sort of, you're like in an impregnable fortress when you're in the hands of God. You are secure in Him. Think about it. Not just I am strong. The Lord is, this, what does it say there? Uh, the Lord, verse one, the Lord is the strength of my life. Look it up in your different translations. My stronghold, my fortress, my rock, my safe place. That's where we are. We're not only saved, the Lord is our salvation, but we're also in a safe place. Are you in a safe place there in Christ? Amen. Amen. Okay. So that's a very confident start to this psalm. And then from Psalm 27, verse 4 and 5, it says, One thing I have desired of the Lord, that will I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, and to behold the beauty of the Lord, and to inquire in his temple. For in the time of trouble, he shall hide me in his pavilion. In the secret place of his tabernacle, he shall hide me. He shall set me high upon a rock. So here's what David is saying. I've got one prayer request. Now, I don't think it means he only has one ever prayer request. Okay, how many have got one thing above all the other prayer requests you've got? Okay, let's have this. How many of you pray here? Are there any of you who pray? Okay, if I was to ask you right now, what are you praying for? What is your number one prayer? What is your uh, priority prayer? Oh, well, I can't, can't think about it. I can assume many things. Maybe you come to God in prayer and you've got a shopping list. So many different things that you go, I, I just go through lots of different things. But is there one thing and you say, that's, I'm always praying for this one thing, always praying for the same thing over and over and over again. I gotta keep praying for that. See, this is the thing David's saying, one thing, one priority prayer that I keep praying. And what is his prayer? He says, one thing I've desired of the Lord, that will I seek. What is it? That I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. Now, in those days, they didn't have like church services and they didn't have open church buildings like there have been over the last couple of centuries here. But they would have had the tabernacle, the house of the Lord or the temple that they could go to and say, I want to be there. I want to be in God's house. I want to dwell there even. If I could, if, if I could have a little uh, place where I, if they could make me a bed there, I'd do it. <laughs> I want to be there. How many have said, I like going to church, but I wish I could stay there all the time. They can't, you know. But that's what he says, I want to dwell, I would love to dwell there in God's presence all the days of my life. And not only that, who wants to say, well, I, I was a Christian for a while and then I fell away. No, you want to continue to dwell in the house of the Lord. You want to continue to go to God's house because that's your desire. And that should be the desire of every believer to continue to dwell in, to go to the house of the Lord. Amen. All the days of my life. I don't know if he's even thinking about beyond that, but all the days of life on this earth, I want to be in the house of God. Amen? So it's good to see you here today. Yeah? yeah. Amen. And I love to come and meet people in church and seeing all these people in the congregation. Okay, what does he want to do in the house of the Lord? To behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. I don't know how he could have seen the beauty of the Lord, but it seems like he's just there to just meditate and to think about the goodness and the beauty of the Lord. How do you see God? Beautiful? He's beautiful beyond description. Uh, there's no words that can be used to describe the beauty and the goodness of the Lord. But if you could just say, I just can't find enough adjectives to describe God's goodness. Imagine if you said, I come to church and it's rather boring. What do you mean? 
bored? Did you say you're bored when you come to church? Well, you may be looking at the back of someone's head or something because you're not, you're looking, what are you looking at? Uh, I was looking over at uh, all around me to see what other people were doing. Well, don't do that. Get your focus on the Lord. I want to see the beauty of the Lord and think about his magnificence, his loveliness, his, his tender mercies, his compassion, all of these things, the holiness of God, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. What does that mean? It would mean that I would be able to bring my requests, to bring my questions, to unload my heart and say, God, I have so many questions. If I was to ask you, if you had a question, do you have any questions you'd love to ask God? There are lots of things that should come to mind, but imagine say, God, I just want to just bring things to you and ask you stuff. I mean, it would be phenomenal, but that's what he wants. I, do want, I want to be able to inquire. I mean, you can go elsewhere if you want, but if you could say, I want to ask the Lord, maybe he'd give me his answer. And what does it say here in verse five? It says, for in the time of trouble. Well, it seems like David's never out of trouble. It's like, I, and no wonder I dwell in the house of the Lord because I'm always in trouble. But what do you do when you're in trouble? Where do you run to? To whom do you run? I leg it. Well, how about run to the Lord? When I'm in trouble, in the time of trouble, what will he do? He shall hide me in his pavilion. Does anyone know what a pavilion is? It's just different words to describe the same thing. He uses the words pavilion, tabernacle, he's used temple, he's used well, his tent, uh, the booth, yes. All of these are the same type of thing. I want to dwell in, and God will take me into his tent, okay? He'll hide me in his pavilion, in the secret place of his tabernacle. He shall hide me. How many of you have got a secret place? I remember hearing a story, it was so funny, like this guy at workplace who's a Christian and uh, his unsaved friend who he was trying to reach and he, they were talking and he says, well, you know, sorry, but I've got to go to my prayer closet. Oh, said the other guy, prayer closet? Where's that? Oh, it's out in my car. Oh, you have a prayer closet in your car? Yeah, it's my secret place. He was using terminology that the unsafe wouldn't understand. What do you mean you've got a secret place that's a closet in your car? What do you mean by all this? And he was simply saying, I just need to get alone. I just want to be alone where I can be alone with God. And you may have a secret place. I mean, I could ask you this, where is your secret place? I personally like to pray in my own bedroom, okay? With the curtains closed. And just to be alone, shut the door and hope that nobody's coming in. I remember when I was an un, uh, just a new believer having to share a bedroom with my brother. And how am I supposed to have a secret place here? I mean, he could come in at any moment. And I had to put my feet up against the door like uh, and hold the door closed while I'm praying like that. <laughs> okay, then I found out that the only actual door in my parents' house that had a lock on it, apart from the front door, was the bathroom. So when someone's in the bathroom for a long time, do not assume things because he could be praying okay but basically what i'm saying is there should be a secret place where you go to and you might think or the world might think sure you're not safe in there are you you're not safe in your bedroom you're not safe in that car in that closet that store room in your workplace how are you safe well david says in the secret place of his tabernacle he shall hide me i'm in there he shall set me high upon a rock. What are you doing in there? I'm high on a rock. <laughs> what? Really, yes, I feel like I'm invincible in here. I'm on top of a rock. I'm in a high place where my enemies can't touch me. That's the whole idea, isn't it? Isn't that a great place? It might not seem like it when you're at home in prayer in your own little secret place, but there you are, high upon a rock. Amen? And maybe there's a foreshadowing there of, Christ, our rock, the solid rock, the living rock, you know, that we are built upon. Amen? Now, in verse 6, it stands on its own. It says this, And now, 
My head shall be lifted up above my enemies all around me. Therefore, I will offer sacrifices of joy in his tabernacle. I will sing. Yes, I will sing praises to the Lord. Well, he's still upon the rock. Let's, let's imagine him saying, I'm upon a rock. And here on this rock, my head shall be lifted up above my enemies all around me. Yes. You know what? We are actually, we should be looking at our enemies as under our feet. My enemies are below me. They're, I'm, not, I'm not the one who should have my head down. I should be the one. Uh, there's a, okay, sorry, a little distraction there. There's a, um, the idea being that I should be lifted up. My enemies are under my feet. Okay, Ephesians chapter 1 says that he has put all these under our feet. Okay, we're in Christ and they're under his feet. Okay, so under our feet, why should I be the one cast down? Why should I be the one walking around with my head down? That shouldn't be us as believers. Okay, my God, he lift up my head above my enemies all around me. And he says, I will offer sacrifices. Did you know that as New Testament believers, we're not offering Old Testament sacrifices None of you brought your lambs and your goats and your cows in here today, did you? No, or your apples, your oranges, your, and all your fruit and grain. You didn't do that because we're New Testament believers. Okay, we're Bible believers, but we didn't bring the ceremonial sacrifices of the Old Testament. But here David is going even beyond that. He's saying something very interesting, which foreshadows something, because he says, therefore I will offer sacrifices. Well, what kind of sacrifices is he gonna bring here? He tells us, therefore, I will offer sacrifices of joy in his tabernacle. I will sing. Yes, I will sing praises to the Lord. And that's what it is. The, the, the great offering and sacrifice that we should bring to the Lord is ones full of joy and singing praise to God. So can we do that? You know, when you see Christians who just do not want to worship, there's... I just, I just don't know why that is, where people in, in worship services stand there either like this, which is five times, or hands in the pockets, or, well, what's with this? Uh, we, we, should we not be full of the joy and thanksgiving for what God has done for us? And not only that, but in the New Testament, you know what we read, and this is over in Hebrews chapter 13, and... Um, verse 15 let me just check i'm not exactly following these notes but in verse hebrews 13 15 says this therefore by him let us continually offer the sacrifice of praise to god that is the fruit of our lips giving thanks to his name but do not forget to do good and to share or with such sacrifices, God is well pleased. So there's a different form of sacrifices. And David was kind of foreshadowing that when he said, I'm gonna bring sacrifices of joy and I'm gonna sing praises to God. Even that, we are to bring those kind of sacrifices in God's house today, amen? All right, now, Psalm 27, verses seven to 10 says this, Hear, O Lord, when I cry with my voice, have mercy also upon me and answer me. When you said, seek my face, my heart said to you, your face, Lord, I will see. Do not hide your face from me. Do not turn your servant away in anger. You have been my help. Do not leave me nor forsake me, O God of my salvation. When my, mo when my father and my mother forsake me, then the Lord will take care of me. Okay, this sounds like a real prayer. A real prayer is something like this. When you cry out with your voice and you're expecting God to answer, because he says, hear, O Lord, when I cry with my voice, have mercy. And this is the kind of mercy where it is loving, loving kindness toward him. Have mercy also upon me and answer me. Are you expecting an answer when it comes to prayer? David was. He really did expect an answer. But he says this, when you said, wherever he got this from, 
maybe in the Old Testament somewhere, when you said, seek my face, my heart said to you, your face, Lord, I will seek. I wonder, do we really seek the face of God? Sometimes it seems that we seek God's hands. You may have heard some people teaching that before, but it's true. Many people say, I seek what God can give me with his hands. I seek what his hands can do. Maybe he will stretch forth his hands to heal the sick. And there's nothing wrong with that, of course. But isn't there something more intimate about seeking the face of God, saying, I want to know you and what you want? Because that is what it means to seek the face of God. I want to know you intimately, personally, and I want to see the blessing of God. And, and, and I want to know what you want, Lord God. See, that's really the heart's desire of this prayer. And he doesn't expect God to turn his face away. Don't turn your face away. Have you ever been talking to somebody and it's, it's not very nice when they just start wandering off. But sometimes you say, I'm like, like a person I was talking to recently, I was like, I gotta get away. I gotta get away. How do I get away? It's quite difficult. But imagine that. Don't, don't you turn your face away from me, Lord. Don't turn away your, your servant away in anger. I, 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 I want to see God work in my life and I want to trust in you and believe God for you to help me. You have been my help. And yet he says this, do not leave me nor forsake me, O God of my salvation. When my father and my mother forsakes me, then the Lord will take care of me. I don't know if there's anyone's ever felt like their father or mother have forsaken them or to be completely abandoned. It might, it might be an awful thing to experience. But even if that did happen, I don't know if anyone's ever actually experienced, but if it did happen, um, the trust here, what David is saying is, that even if that was to happen, I put my trust in the Lord, he will take care of me. Okay? And in the New Testament, again back in the book of Hebrews, there's the testimony of the witness who wrote uh, Hebrews in chapter 13 also, it's a well-known text. And let me see if I can find it. It says, Hebrews 13, um, verse 5, I suppose, let your conduct be without covetousness. Be content with such things that you have. For he himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. That's a good text, isn't it? I will never leave you nor forsake you. So we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? So there's this complete confidence. Every line of this psalm seems to speak about confidence. I have put my trust in God who could never and will, will never let me down. Amen? Okay, so we read in Psalm 27, verse 11 to 13, it says, Teach me your way, O Lord, and lead me in a smooth path because of my enemies. Do not deliver me to the will of my adversaries, for false witnesses have risen against me, and such as breathe out violence. I would have lost heart unless I had believed that I would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Well, there is a path well, there's actually two paths in life, as we know from Psalm 1. There's always two, the two paths. Um, there's the easy path and the hard path. There's the righteous path and the wicked path. Which one are we on? Okay. Now, if we took the easy path, where I have no trouble, no problems, no trials, no difficulties, it may also be the broad path that leads to destruction. But what if he said, I want to be on the path which is right, God's path for me, whatever that is. And if it leads me into difficulties, well, so be it. I believe God that I'm on the path that he has laid out for me. That's why he says here, uh, teach me your way, Lord. I want to do things your way and lead me in a smooth or level or plain path. Uh, I, and we don't want to fall into the ditch, but we want to stay on the path that God has put us on, regardless of what comes our way. Amen. You might say, but this path is not easy. 
there was a stone in the way. There was a hole. There's a ditch. Yes, there is that, but would you, do you want to be on a path where there's never any problems in life? Or do you want to be on a path which has these things, yet God is with you the whole time? Okay? Because of my enemies, yes. Do not deliver me to the will of my adversaries, for false witnesses have risen against me, even in the New Testament. That's why this, um, there's a commentary by William MacDonald, and he was literally seeing this psalm as the fulfillment of Jesus Christ's uh, life. Because definitely, according to Matthew chapter 26, um, 59 to 61, false witnesses rose up against Jesus and said, he said he would destroy the temple in three days. We heard him say it. And in John chapter 2, no, John chapter 2, verses 19 to 21, Jesus had said that, but he was talking about his body. So these people had risen up as false witnesses. Can you see how someone could read that and go, that's exactly what happened to Jesus. False witnesses rose up against him and condemned him, um, yet he wanted to stay on the path that God had planned out for him, didn't he? Did he say, oh, no, I'm never going to fulfill what God's plans are? No, he did not. He stuck to the path, even though this false witnesses were against him. It was all part of God's plan, wasn't it? Okay. But David also would have experienced many times like that. Well, there were times when he was accused in the wrong, falsely accused. And he says, even if that happens, I still trust in the Lord. And here's the reason. He says um, in verse 12, very important verse, I would have lost heart unless I had believed that I would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. If you look that up in different translations, you've got the NIV says, I remain confident of, of this. And the New Living Translation says, yet I am confident. The ESV says, I believe. And the King James Version says, I had fainted. And the, uh, the uh, NASB 1995, I would have despaired. And the NASB, I certainly believe. Believed. Something kept him from fainting, the King James Version, or from despairing. And it was his belief. What did he believe? It's one thing, oh, I'm believing. Believing for what? He says here, he says, I would have lost heart. I would have fainted, but I kept on believing. I would have lost heart unless I believed that I would see the goodness of the Lord. Where? In the land of the living. Let me ask you, what, where is the land of the living? Years ago, people would have said, well, that's talking about heaven. That's where the real land of, of the living is. There's no dead there, right? But he's probably talking about here on earth, right? That I'm going to see the goodness of the Lord right now in this life. I'm going to experience the goodness, the blessing of the Lord right here. Amen? That's where we want to see it. I mean, yeah. The good thing is for us believers, we get to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living, but there's also something else. We get the icing on the cake. We get that cherry on the top of that as well, because we've got all of this to go. As I've said before, what we have here is not just what we call pie in the sky when you die. You know what I mean by pie in the sky when you die? You ever heard of that before? Some of you might, maybe if you're not English speaker, you go, what? There's some pie? Some pie in the sky when I die? Or is it what we say is, it's stick on your plate while you wait. Because you can have some of these things right now, can't you? You don't always experience it, but we'll tell you what, I'm expecting to see it. And he says, I was believing God that I will see God's goodness in the land of the living. And he says, there's one condition, however, I think it's a condition in verse 14. Are you prepared to wait? Verse 14 says, wait on the Lord, be of good courage, and he shall strengthen your heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. There's a lot of waiting involved in this, and that's a bit we don't necessarily like. I, God, give me patience. Give it to me right now. 
Yeah, that doesn't work, does it? But we, have, we are to look to God and say, God, I'm asking you to help me. I keep my eyes focused on you. It says, um, be of good courage. That sounds very like Joshua, chapter 1, verse 8, where Joshua says, be strong and of good courage. Be fear not, nor be dismayed. Trust in God, amen, and he shall see it. Now, the one last thing I wanted to say is this, that all of these things perhaps are just a reflection also of Paul's words in Romans chapter 8, verses 37 to 39. And we're going to close with these. Just let me read this to you, really short verses. And it says, I mean, consider all of that you go through and consider this. Yet, in all these things, we are more than conquerors. Are you more than a conqueror today? Through him who loved us. For I am persuaded. Sounds very like David. I'm confident. I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen? Nothing. No matter what comes against me, with that, my enemies come against me to eat my flesh. They attack me from all sides. I'm in a safe place. I'm in the love of God, and I'm held in the love of God. And I don't care what comes because I'm on the right path. This is the sort of confidence that David has. And as believers, we ought to have. Why? Because we've come to the light of truth, the light of our salvation, Jesus Christ. He has put us upon a rock. Our lives are built upon a rock. And we are safe and secure in him no matter what comes our way. Amen? We've got good reason to rejoice. Amen? Amen.